What a time to have a prophecy day. You know, if the events of literally the last two days are not enough to get us on the edge of our seats ready for the return of Christ, and I don't know what is. It is truly a wake-up call to wake up the mighty men. But it's a wake-up call to you and me, isn't it, brothers and sisters? What this world is just starting to witness is almost shocking, almost surprising. But it shouldn't be surprising to us, brothers and sisters. How many times have we talked about the rise of Russia from this platform over the years? How long have Christadelphians been saying that Russia will rise, that we'll start seeing things like this? And people laughed at us, our work colleagues, our people at school, and now it's starting. We've seen the full-scale invasion in the Ukraine. We're seeing the world in turmoil. We're seeing Russia do things nobody thought would happen. But they are happening. The greatest movement of troops since World War II. The battle for Kiev. They actually think while we're speaking right now, any minute Kiev could fall. They're expecting it to fall today. So brothers and sisters, we should be on the edge of our seats. We should be awake. The Lord could be here at any time. Now, we don't want to be sensationalist. We don't know precisely what's going to happen. But what we're going to do in our talk today is have a look through and remind ourselves of what we know definitely is going to be happening. And we'll unfold that together. Here's Putin. Just think about this, brothers and sisters. We have taken the decision to conduct a special military operation because a hostile anti-Russia is being created on our historic lands. To anyone who would consider interfering from the outside, if you do, you will face consequences greater than any you have faced in history. All relevant decisions have been taken. I hope you hear me. I still don't think the West have heard him. Do you? We'll find out. It's shocking, isn't it? They don't think he's going to stop some commentators at the Ukraine. We're going to look at some prophecies that will suggest it won't just stop in the Ukraine. Eventually, it's going to overspill. And our brother Jonathan particularly is going to be talking about how it's going to come right down to God's people in Israel. This conflict could just be the start of the great things that we read of in our prophecy. And what did our brother Thomas tell us, brothers and sisters, as he started our community all those years ago when he wrote Elpis Israel in, in 19, uh, 1848. He says to us this, when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things at present constituted is at hand. And we read this, you know, occasionally at Prophecy Days and we bring it out, but how relevant is it to you and me today? We are seeing this begin. Now, in another preface to Elpis Israel, one of our brethren, interestingly, wrote this. And I just think it's quite a fitting thing for us to reflect on. He said, during the past 10 years, and this was in 1839, I think. If that's right. 59. 1859. This is our brother in 1859. During the past 10 years, a succession of events has demonstrated that a fixed and predetermined purpose is in process of development, unknown indeed to the powers that be, but known of God, revealed in his word, and guided by his hand. What's that purpose, we might ask? That purpose is the gathering together of the hosts of the nations against Jerusalem to war, that the eternal spirit by Jesus, the King of Kings, may smite them upon the mountains of Israel, and in concert with resurrected and living saints at the head of the armies of Israel, re-establish the throne and kingdom of David and subjugate all other, all other kingdoms to this new power in the earth. Now, if that was relevant in 1859, brothers and sisters, what do you think this brother would be saying to us today if he was stood in my shoes? This is happening, brothers and sisters. It's starting to happen. 
And that belief of the purpose of God that existed at the, the birth of our Christadelphian community is, is, is here, it's alive, and it's strong. God's word has not changed. This is still God's purpose, brothers and sisters, young people, friends. And we're going to see that as we go through today. We're going to look at a set of prophecies I like to call the Armageddon prophecies. We're going to look into Revelation, Joel, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. We're going to do it relatively swiftly. But we want to remind ourselves of the authority of our faith. Because the authority of our faith doesn't rely in Brother Thomas Brother Matt Davis, please, please don't do that. It relies in the word of God, doesn't it? And so that's what we're going to do. And as we go through these, think about this. Because we're, what we're thinking about here is not our own human reasoning. It's not sensationalism. We've been saying this for hundreds of years. Why? Because it's in the word. And we compare these prophecies together. So what we do is we harmonize the prophet, prophecies like we harmonize the gospels to gain understanding of what God is teaching us, the generation living in the latter days. And so as we go through this, I'm going to be pointing out some of the kind of the harm, harmonizing features to show you that these are kind of layered prophecies. And this is how God works. He wants us to search out the scriptures to gain our understanding. So we're going to find in these passages that there are the same characters appearing in these prophecies. The similar circumstances, ideas, and words as God inspired his prophets. Similar events and similar time periods mentioned. The same locations mentioned. And the biggest one, the same outcome. And we've seen the outcome here in Joel 3, verse 16. Yahweh, the Lord, also shall roar out of Zion. And it says in verse 17 that Jerusalem would be holy. Now, that shouldn't surprise us as we go through these. I, just want, I don't want to labor this too much, but I just want to make this point. Everything that we say today, everything I say, everything Brother John says, everything Brother Don says, is predicated on our appreciation, our faith, our belief in the doctrine of inspiration. In the idea and our belief that every single word was originally inspired by God's power, chosen and designed by God for a purpose and a reason, that he caused these things to be written. So it's not just Joel, the prophet Joel's opinion. It's not just Ezekiel's opinion bound with the constraints, uh, the limiting constraints that these prophets would have had as mere men. The holy word of God was inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And so we know this. These are the classic passages we turn to. All scripture given by inspiration of God, breathed out by God. We know from Peter, the uh, first Peter chapter 1, that the prophets, after they were compelled to write some of the things they wrote, they searched back through what they wrote to understand it more be uh, in, in a better way. So this cannot just be the opinions of these prophets. This is much bigger than that, brothers and sisters. So we expect God to be able to tell us about our time. We expect it to be intelligible. And here's the thing. There's some that say we can never understand some of these prophecies. It's just, you know, these were, these were prophets. They were just predicting events bound by their own social constraints back in the day. But these verses and our faith and inspiration say no to that. Because we are the generation, as I'll show you, living in the latter days. And I'll ask you one question. What would the point be of God inspiring texts 2,000 years ago that are going to teach us what's going to be happening in the latter days if we can't understand them? What would the point be? I suggest strongly that that viewpoint is not correct. That we stand here today excited and thankful and praiseful for the fact that God has compelled his prophets, preserved his word down through time, and we can understand it and lift our heads up from our scriptures and be encouraged and know that our Lord is nearly here. So, let's get into this. Revelation. Before you get to chapter 16, I want to quickly stop off at chapter 1. Because... If, um, if you've not done this before, it's very important that we understand the book of Revelation is a book of symbol. There's a couple of things that we read of it in the very start of Revelation chapter 1 that teaches us this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God 
gave unto him. You see, God inspired this. God gave this. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Three rules there. I call them the revelation rules. Number one, this book of revelation is for the servants of Christ. In other words, primarily this book is, is written for the enlightened faithful believers who've committed through baptism to Christ. It's not going to teach you about the gospel. It's not going to teach you first principles. It's going to teach, it's going to encourage the servants. It's like a letter from Christ himself to us, to all the saints down through the ages. And that's what rule number two is about. Because it says, it's going to show unto these servants things which must shortly come to pass. And so we appreciate that the events in Revelation are a gradual unfolding of history before it's even happened. And finally, it's, um, it's there and it says it's that they sent and signified it by the angel unto his servant John. And signified really, it means encoded. It's, 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 it's a book of symbol. And so we as Christadelphians appreciate the fact that, that it's kind of encoded. So people outside, they don't understand it. You'll only fully appreciate the book of Revelation if you study the rest of Scripture. If you are a true servant of God and you seek to apply that to the book of Revelation. So whatever our stage of spiritual growth is, brothers and sisters, I think we can all agree that we should be trying to appreciate this book if we identify as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now just flick your eyes to verse 19 because it says, John is told to write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now the things that he'd seen are in chapter 1 up until that point in verse 19. So what are the things which are and the things that are, shall be hereafter? Let's just flick over to Revelation chapter 4 and we'll see that that um, is told to us because in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, we read, after this, I looked, and by the way, after this, what had, what, did he just, what had just happened in chapter 2 and 3? He was told to write letters to the seven ecclesias. And so he writes letters to ecclesias um, of that time as he's asked to do. And so after that, verse 1, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, as a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so from chapter 4 onwards, we have the things which will be hereafter explained to us. A gradual unfolding of history. We call it the continual historic um, revelation. And when we get, we can't do all the whole book of Revelation, as you'll appreciate. When we get to Revelation chapter 16, we get to our time. So let's get to Revelation 16. Now we know it's our time. How do we know it's our time? Well, in verse 12, we read that this epoch of time has the symbol of an angel pouring out a vial on the great river Euphrates. And we see that this vial's poured out. It's a bit of an enigma, really. He's pouring out his vial, and, and it's pouring out, and yet the Euphrates is shrinking because it says there, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. In verse 13, we read of these three unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And then in verse 14, notice this, it says that they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then verse 16, and he gathered them in, together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now there's a lot in that, but let's just think about it carefully. Now, we mentioned Revelation is a book of symbol. So when we come across, for example, the great river Euphrates drying up, it doesn't literally mean the, liver, the river Euphrates is going to dry up. It's a symbol. It's a token of something else. So we ask the question, what do rivers symbolize in the scripture? And we know that they symbolize the power 
that through which they reside. You can see that if you're taking notes, Isaiah 8, 7 to 8, Assyria is described in that way. And Ezekiel 29, verse 3, Egypt, the Nile, is described in that way. So the power through which the river resides is, is, is the power. And sometimes those powers are described as overflowing their banks. And sometimes, as in here, they're described as contracting and evaporating. So we ask the question, well, what power is this talking about? And so there's the Euphrates. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. And it just so happens that, of course, that power, there was, a, there was a, 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 an empire, a power that controlled the whole of the territory of the Euphrates, and it was the Ottoman Empire. And what has happened since the 1800s is that, remarkably, that power has slowly been evaporating, and particularly after World War I, it shrunk to this tiny area in Turkey before it just kind of resettled down um, to what we have today, the Republic of Turkey. Now, the point here, we could go through a lot, say a lot more about that, but the point here is, is that the Euphrates has dried up. That Turkish power has shrunk. We are in this sixth vile period. And so we're expecting these frog spirits to go out and draw the nations to a great battle, as we read in verse 14. And it's strange, isn't it, how it, how it, how it describes it there. This battle that they're gathered to, the great day of God Almighty, is described and called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now, it just so happens in Hebrew, I'm not a linguist, but you can split this word up, Armageddon. And it means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And as we say, the scriptures, you know, God expects us to not just kind of focus and take verses out of context, but to, to study his word and appreciate his word. And once we do that, anyone that's, that's really got their mind in the prophets of Israel will know that this phrase is lifted from Joel chapter 3 that we had as our opening chapter. So let's go back to Joel chapter 3. And while you do that, think about this. This is harvest language, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And a lot of the, the, the prophecies, including Daniel chapter 2, the famous prophecy of the kingdom of men being destroyed, is referenced in these terms. The, the, the sort of harvest language. So let's go to Joel chapter 3 that our, our brother read for us earlier. Now, we believe that Joel, he's not to, we're not told precisely, but we believe he actually prophesied around the time of Hezekiah, around 900 BC. And in Joel chapter 1 and 2, the prophet talks about terrible calamities that would happen upon his people of Israel and that their country would be devoured by the lions of Assyria and others. But Joel 3 looks ahead to something bigger, to a time when the downtrodden nation would revive again un under God's glory. And so we, we see that here. I mean, you see the end picture. I've mentioned it alre already. A picture of the kingdom of God that's going to be restored on the earth. A picture when Jerusalem will be holy once again. And we believe as Christadelphians, this is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return and sit again on the throne of his father David, which, of course, was in Jerusalem. But when is this chapter really talking about from verse 1 onwards? Well, look at, look at verse 1 with me. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. First point. Have we seen God bring again the captivity of Judah? Answer, yes. Have we seen God bring again the captivity of Jerusalem? Answer, yes. Both of those territories and the city of Jerusalem are now in the hands of the Jews. He has done that. This is our time, brothers and sisters. Joel 3 is our time. We're living in it. We've been living in it for a while. Have we got complacent? 
We've seen the people of Israel coming back by droves. We've seen the population increasing. We've seen them turn deserts, as we see here at the top. There's Tel Aviv, founded by, I think, about 60, 66 families, Jewish families, outside of Jaffa. They just went out and said, we've got to find this, found this city. We've seen the desert bloom, literally. Look at that. That's the city today, a modern city. In fact, you might have noticed, some of you, in your news, only just um, in December, that Tel Aviv is now the world's most expensive city to live in. So this prophecy is a prophecy for our time. We're living in this time. Now, what does it say there? It said that, that God would bring these nations down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, if you... Um, if you look at that word Jehoshaphat, it actually means God's judgment in Hebrew. God's judgment. And then if you jump across to verse 14, we read multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And uh, at least in my margin, the, the translators have kindly said, or concision, or threshing. So we have the nations being gathered to the valley of God's judgment for threshing, for a good threshing. There's no doubt then that this prophecy of Joel 3 links powerfully with Revelation chapter 16. It's the same story. The nations are being gathered for threshing, Armageddon, a battle which is going to take place. Now, we haven't had time to really go through this in massive depth, but it's just interesting to note in passing that two of these nations are kind of a, like, it would seem to me like a, a sideshow almost. It's kind of just like thrown in a mention of two of the nations that, that kind of uh, are come or two of the areas that, that, that are antagonistic to Israel that come to, to battle. Um, God sort of challenges them. What have you to do with me, Tyre, Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? And it's just interesting to think that this prophecy thousands of years ago, depicts literally the picture that we see today in the land of Israel. Because we have got antagonistic peoples in the coasts of Palestine, in the Gaza Strip, and to the north, where Tyre and Zidon are, with the organizations of Hezbollah and Hamas. We saw some of that last year, kicking off in the land of Israel. These two territories get on the bandwagon. They're separate to these nations, but they get on the bandwagon, and they, they come and, uh, and join in. Now, that's all we've got time, sadly, to talk about. But look at the message of the prophet. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. What did we see today with the Ukrainians? They're basically saying, we are strong. You've got people who were farmers, literally, with, with plowshares, as it were, now taking AK-47s, or the Russian equivalent. It's unbelievable. And, you know, think about this, and I say this to our young brethren. Anyone in Ukraine, aged 18 to 60, cannot leave the Ukraine. They are expected to fight. They're giving out rifles in, 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 in cartons to anyone that will take them. And they're fighting street to street. Now, of course, we might think, ah, that's over there in the Ukraine. But if Russia steps into any NATO territory, it's going to be World War III. And the things that our brethren faced in World War II and World War I will come suddenly to the fore. We need to sharpen up on our faith and our appreciation of our conscientious objection, brothers and sisters. And sisters, don't think you're getting away with it either. We all need to be alert to this. So... Pay attention to what the Military Service Committee are, 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 are speaking to us about. Brothers and sisters, please, we need to be ready for these things. The nations are preparing for war. They are waking up the mighty men. There is going to be a battle with the nations between uh, God and the nations. But what is the end going to be? As we've already mentioned, the kingdom of God is the outcome. Because Yahweh is going to act. In verse 16, um, it, well, verse, verse um, where is it? It verse says verse 17. This is the key point. What is all of that battle going to be about? So that the nations will know 
that I am Yahweh, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. The nations don't know God now, but they will know God after that. So let's quickly get to Daniel 11. Um, Daniel chapter 11. On the way, we're going to stop off again, just quickly. Daniel chapter 10, we're going to stop off at on the way, because it's all part of the same section. Daniel 10, at the start, we read of the amazing prophet Daniel. And he's mourning for three full weeks. He wants to understand and appreciate Bible prophecy. So listen, brothers, sisters, if you don't feel you've got a grasp on prophecy, be inspired by Daniel. He was mourning. It's not a good thing to be ignorant. He wants to know. He he really wants to put the work in and he's, he's praying and he's mourning three full weeks to appreciate what's going on. And it's amazing because um, if you actually flick over, he's sent an angel. And in verse 14, this angel appears to this faithful man and says this. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people, the people of Israel, in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Now tuck that phrase, the latter days, in your mind. The great climax of the prophecy is going to teach Daniel what's going to happen in the latter days. And then we get into chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is complicated. But in essence, it's a prophecy of Alexander the Great's empire breaking up into four. And the prophecy picks up on two of the territories that are dubbed the King of the North Territory and the King of the South. And it's an amazing prophecy, detailed prophecy, of what's going to happen between these, these occupying powers that occupy the North and the South down through time in history. Now, when we get to verse 40, so we're jumping, we're jumping to verse 40. When we get to verse 40, we read of these two territories. Now, the territory that I most want to draw your attention to is what was called the Seleucid Tem Territory. So one of Alexander's generals, he's on the screen now, Seleucus, he controlled this territory, and he became known in the scriptures as the King of the North. And oc any occupying power that occupied that territory was known as the King of the North. There's also an occupying power in the South, the King of the South. We're not going to focus on that. And it's interesting, as we say, these two things go on. The king of the north does something, then the king of the south, and they're kind of constantly warring. Israel's kind of in between both of those warring territories down through time. And then it's interesting because throughout the chapter, at one point, in verse, um, in verse for example, verse uh, 30 onwards, and verse 36 particularly, there's no more king of the south and king of the north. It just becomes a king. And that's because when we get to that point in the, in the prophecy, the north and the south had been controlled by the same king. So we don't have north and south anymore, it's just the king. And then we get to verse, and by the way, that king was um, ruling in Constantinople, in Turkey. I'm doing this real quick, so forgive me. Our brother warned me, he said, didn't he? We can't go through, we can't go over time. So if we're going quick, I apologize. But we need to do this. So verse 40 is where we want to get to. And that at the time of the end, the end of what? The latter days that the angels come to show Daniel about. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. Who's the him? Well, it's the him, I believe, of verse 36, the king in Constantinople that was over the north and the south. So the king of the south pushes at him. And it just so happens that in World War I, the British had control of the territory of the South, the e Egypt Territory. And they did, as the occupying power of Egypt, push against the, the power of Constantinople, the Ottoman Empire, and pushed them right back up, dried up the river Euphrates. I believe that's been fulfilled. The King of the South has come and gone and pushed at the him, the Constantinople power. But then, the King of the North shall come against him like a whirlwind with a chariot with horsemen with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over he shall enter into the glorious land many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps 
But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And we just want to pull out a couple of things here. This king of the north is going to come against, we believe, the power in Constantinople. We believe, it's talking of Russia, we'll show you that in a minute, will eventually get into Turkey, overflow, come down and come into Israel. He'll go past Israel, go into Egypt. But then we'll hear these tidings, we'll have to go back up to Jerusalem and then come to his end. And we believe this prophecy is the same. It's the same story of the nations being sucked into this war as, as the king of the north comes down. And look at the territories the king of the north has to, has to be in charge of. We'll touch on that in a minute as we go through. So if we were to say, okay, well, that's, that's all great, Matt. Is there anything more implicit, you know, in the scriptures about who these nations might be? We've looked at a few. We've looked at a couple of nice maps. Are they named? And we say, well, yes, they are. Because in Ezekiel chapter 38, we have, again, the same story of Armageddon, the nations being gathered to battle and then coming to their end. And we see that so wonderfully prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 38. So let's get over to Ezekiel 38. Now just to summarize the prophecy of Ezekiel 38, in verses 1 through 7, we have described a list of nations which are going to come and attack Israel. Now bear in mind, Ezekiel is prophesying, you know, 600 BC-ish. So these nations are, are, are listed actually in, in the, the names that they would have been known as around that time. So we have to, we're going to have to go back into history to figure out, well, what are these, what is it talking about? Some of them we know. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And, um, and then if you think about it, verse 8 to 17, we have the details of the attack. We have uh, why this invasion takes place. Brother Jonathan's going to speak to that in our next talk, God willing. And then in verse 18 to the end, we read that God acts. God acts to save his people of Israel. And we're going to show you that we believe that's through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints. Us that have been baptized, God willing, and all our brothers and sisters that have fallen asleep. Now, we're given some markers as to when this time period is that this invasion takes place. So if you look at verse 8, it says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Hebrew is the same. The latter days, the same as Daniel chapter 10. The same as Daniel chapter 11, when the invasion from the north takes place, from the king of the north who comes down. It's the same period. It's the same time period, look, when Israel has been regathered. Because we read verse 8, after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Ezekiel's prophesying in the time when the people of Israel had been taken by the Babylonians and were in captivity. And he's told this prophecy that one day you're going to be regathered, but there's going to be this mighty battle that's going to take place. But then God's going to act. And look what happens at the end. Verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. That's after these armies are destroyed. And here's the punchline. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. And they shall know that I am Yahweh. It's the same story as Joel. It's the same story as Revelation 16. It's the same story as Daniel 11. We've just got extra details, and some of those details are here. Now, in verse 16, it does say, This army comes up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days there again, in case we didn't get it first time. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So, again, the latter days. Look at verse 17, though. We've mentioned all these prophecies knit together. This is what the prophet says to us. Thus saith the Lord God, 
Art thou he, this is Gog, the, the chief invader, if you like, the leader, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? So this isn't a one-off prophecy. We are right to knit these prophecies together, the Armageddon prophecies, I would suggest to you, because we have here in the text the saying, God said, look, my prophets have been talking about this. This is the great battle that's going to take place. We have the same time period. Israel are back in the land. The, the prophecy depicts them being wealthy and, uh, because this invader comes for a spoil. And they come against the mountains of Israel. Interestingly, it doesn't mention... Um, by the way, the mountains of Israel are that sort of spine in the middle of Israel. They're the West Bank Territory. Isn't it amazing that 2,000 odd years later we have controversy right now on the mountains of Israel? We don't have any mention of an Arab or Palestinian people in this prophecy on the mountains of Israel. So some of us, you know, and I think it's quite a reasonable thing to think about, you know, might expect the annexation of the West Bank. But anyway... This is a powerful prophecy because it depicts then the state of the nations just before this invasion takes place and it depicts the state of the nations just before the Lord Jesus Christ returns and God acts and establishes the kingdom. Verse 18, it mentions, just tuck this one away, sorry, 19 and, and in verse 19, a great shaking. There's this powerful earthquake that's going to take place in the land of Israel during this time when God acts. Just tuck that one away. And another thing to tuck away, I just thought I couldn't really pass by with all that we've been suffering um, without mentioning. Have you noticed this before in verse 22 that God says, I will plead against him, this is the invader, with pestilence and with blood. Pestilence, disease. In fact, it's mentioned, we've not got time to go to Joel uh, Habakkuk 3, but it's also mentioned in Habakkuk 3. And you know that word there? I will plead. It's the Hebrew sapat, which is the same word in Joel 3, verse 2, where God will plead or judge the nations. So these are, these are all interconnected, as we can see. And isn't it interesting? We're seeing some of these pestilences perhaps begin to fall. Now, let's go back to these nations then. Who are these nations? We're not got time to go through all, all of them. We do this from time to time from our prophecy days. But just on the screen, roughly, we've, we've put um, where we believe they are. Some of them are quite obvious, like we mentioned in verse 5. You see, we've got Persia. Well, we know where Persia is. We've still got the Persian Gulf. They forgot to rename that when they named Persia Iran. So we know where that is. We've got North African nations in Libya and Ethiopia. We believe we've got European nations, and we've got Russian nations, uh, Russian peoples. So... They're all coming, it tells us, against Israel. And verse 15 tells us that they come from the north. It's the same story as Daniel 11. Now look at what Brother Thomas says. I'm going to have to lean down for this because I can't see it. I, can't t I better not touch it. The brother will go mad. He says, by turning to a map of Europe and Asia, the reader may trace out the territory of the kingdom of Babylon as it is destined to exist in its last form under the king of the north in his Gogian manifestation. Now, look what Brother Thomas is doing, right? This is the heritage of our community. He's taking Daniel 2, which is the image, image empire, which has stood up, um, the kingdom of Babylon, its different phases. It's all those territories, he says. He's taking um, the king of the north prophecy in Daniel 11, and he's taking this prophecy here in Ezekiel 38, and he's blending them together, and he's saying it's the same story. And he's saying, look, this is all going to happen this manifestation of the kingdom of men. And he says the names of the countries furnished by Ezekiel will lead him to a just conception of its general extent. Besides all the Russias, it will take in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Prussia, Austria, Turkey, Persia, Tartary, Greece, the, Amer the Roman, Africa, and Egypt. This will be a dominion of great magnitude from the north wall of China and Afghanistan and from the ice sea to the deserts of Africa and Arabia. It's a big, it's a big extent of peoples that are united together. We're not even going to have time to go into Afghanistan. I, I thought I'll have to, time to talk about that. 
today, but we're just not going to have time. But we've seen Russia moving into a lot of these territories. Brother Don will no doubt touch on a lot of this. I'm hoping anyway, because I can't do everything. <laughs> what does he say, though? Well, let's pick up on a couple. Son of man, set thy face unto Gog of the land of Magog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. That's, um, that's the, the better translation of verse 2. The idea there in the King James, the, the chief prince, it's, it's better, and better kind of phrased as a noun, better translated as a name, because it's the way it's constructed. The, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So this leader of this invading force is this mysterious character called Gog. And we're told here specifically he is the leader of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, but he's of the land of Magog. And we say, well, that's nice, Matt. I've never heard anyone talk to me about Magog before. Like, where's that on the map? But as I say, this, is, this has been um, given in the, the time period, six, around 600 BC, so we have to try and look back in history to find out where the land of Magog is. So we go and we open up our dusty, I hate history, by the way, but it's exciting when it connects to Bible prophecy, isn't it? And I've done a bit of dusty history reading, and this is what we find. Here's Josephus. Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. So this is Josephus around 94 AD, and he says, look, these people, the Magogites, they were, are actually called by the Greeks Scythians. So we say, oh, that's nice. Well, where are the Scythians? So we go back even more in time to the Greeks. So Josephus was at the Roman times, about 94 AD, and he says, before me, they called them the Scythians. So we go back to the father of history, Herodotus. There's not much history before Herodotus. It just doesn't exist. So we can't go back much further. And we say to Herodotus, where was the Scythians? And Herodotus says to us, look, there are eight rivers that run through the land of Scythia, most of which I cannot pronounce. So we won't pronounce them. But the key thing here is there's the River Don and the River Danube. They're the two extents of what Herodotus tells us were the rivers that ran through the territory of the Scythians, which was, as Josephus calls us, tells us, the territory of the Magogites. So we can quite safely say, very simply, that this territory here, by the way, there's other rivers in, in between, but they're the two extent, that that territory there, central Europe, is the land of Magog. Now, when we put a modern map on the screen, we've highlighted the two rivers there, notice what's smack bang in the middle of both those two rivers. The Ukraine. You can see it there. So, the prophecy says, look, this power is going to have, I would suggest to you, the Ukraine, the, the Central Europe, coupled here, and we're going to see in a minute, with, with the Russians. Now, I know sometimes we talk about um, Mago being linked to Germany, and of course, the, the, the far extent is. But look in the middle, is the Ukraine in the center of what the prophecy is about? So that's the first thing, Magog. It's that whole Central European swathe. Let's have a quick look at the other uh, name that we've mentioned, the Prince of Rosh. What's that talking about, the Rosh? Well, fascinatingly, around 200 BC, um, the Septuagint version of the Bible was uh, reportedly been put together. And the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So this is 200 BC, and the... The, the scholars of that um, translation, they took a look at this and they said, ah, this is a proper name, that's the first point, and it is the Rus, the prince of the Rus, which was obviously a people they understood uh, and, and probably believed, you know, knew about back in the day. So that's around 200 BC. And we can see that there um, in some of the history books. The modern name Russia comes from the Byzantine Greek Rosia, which is derived from the Rus or the Rus. And interestingly, this phrase, this, this way, this, this kind of Rus um, name, as we show there, is the part of the modern name of how you say Russia in Greek today. So the Greeks are saying the Rus are the Russians, right? Now, look at this. Who are the Rus then? Who are the Rus? 
Well, they're kind of a bit obscured in history because they're in the, the wet area of Europe, um, just, to the north, just in, in the center and to the north. And we read this, around the turn of the ninth century, the Rus, the Rus, were barely visible. Small bands of traders trekking along the rivers through the, the dense and sparsely populated northern forests between the Baltic and the Middle Volga. That's fascinating, isn't it? They were bands of kind of people that, that were in that territory, that area. History is virtually silent on them until we get to the 9th century AD. And in the 9th century AD, they pop up all over the place. They've expanded. They go over and they talk to the Franks. Uh, uh, an Arab um, explorer comes across them by the river Volga. And they established themselves then as a, as a people. In fact, when it comes to 860 AD or around about, the Rus come to Constantinople and attack it. And do you know what's exciting about this? I don't know if you've seen this before, but there was a, a Bible student, probably a little unsound, but nonetheless, he still opened his Bible. And this is what he said when that happened. He's called Leo the Deacon. And this is what he says. This is 1050 AD, commentating on what happened when the Rus attacked Constantinople. He says, when night fell, since the moon was nearly full, they, the Rus, came out of the plain and searched for their dead. That this people is reckless and warlike and mighty and attacks all the neighboring peoples is attested by many people among them, the holy Ezekiel, who alludes to them when he says as follows, Behold, I will bring upon you Gog and Magog, the ruler of the Rusi. Now, obviously, he got his timing wrong. But the, the key point here is he's, he's saying, look, these people that are attacking Constantinople, they are prophesied in the Bible, and they are the Rus. He made the identification. It's not just Christadelphians that have been doing this. This is, this is what um, other, others have done simply by understanding the Bible and understanding and identifying these nations. So we can add to this land of Magog, you know, the, the, the chief, uh, the prince of Rosh, Rosh, or the Rus, Meshach, and Tubal. And by the way, Meshach is, um, from that came the Moscovites, and from them was found in Moscow. So we're talking about the territory of Russia here. I hope you can see that. We've whizzed through that. But that is why we, as Christadelphians, are interested in the movements of Russia. Because we believe God's named Russia as the leading invading force which will ultimately come down into Israel for the Battle of Armageddon. Ultimately, we believe that the kingdom of men will be united again and that the pinnacle, the leader of that, will be the Russians. Now, let's just think about Russia then, the Rus. Let's just re rewind to about 1991. Christadelphians were saying, you know, Russia's coming. Some of us thought maybe it's the Soviet Union. And what happened was, very interestingly, after World War II, of course, NATO was formed, and all those countries got together, and they, they, they had a pact. Uh, and the Soviet Union formed on the other side, and they obviously had communism, a little bit different, very different kind of methodology to life than, than in the West. And in the middle, we have what was called the Eastern Bloc, and they were very much allied with the Soviet Union. So... That was the, that's, what, that's what actually happened in the 1920s, and then eventually it came to this in 1991. But then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, didn't it? And Russia formed, and all these other nations kind of became their own independent nations. And so Russia, because its internal collapse, it, obviously communism wasn't very good economically, um, it spent the next few years licking its wounds, making sure that it didn't kind of fraction anymore. It kind of retreated into its, itself. It's like a bear, you know, retreating into its cave. Incidentally, the current ruler of Russia said this about the collapse of the Soviet Union. He said, above all, we should acknowledge that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical disaster of the century. As for the Russian nation, it became a genuine drama. Tens of millions of our co-citizens and co-patriots found themselves outside Russian territory. Moreover, the epidemic of disintegration infected Russia itself. And so you can see Putin's mindset and the Russian mindset is that those territories that in the Eastern Bloc and in the Soviet Union that were all together, they're still Russian. And they found themselves outside of Russia all of a sudden. Isn't it sad? And so what Putin wants to do 
is benevolently get them back inside Russia again, because that's where they belong, because they are, should be together. And he even said it even more recently, it was reported in 2018 that that is what he basically said. He wanted to, as it were, reverse the collapse of the Soviet Union. So he's been saying this for a while. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a kind of a secret that he wants to get all of these nations back. He wants to, the glory of Russia to shine again. He, he actually wants the Russian Empire back. But we can go on to that later. So when we come to 1991, you know, the Soviet Union collapses, Russia takes its place there, licking its wounds. NATO sat there thinking, oh, this is interesting. Um, Russia's now weak. And so as time has gone on, up until the current day, NATO has actually expanded. Chechnya, Hungary, Poland join NATO. They say, no thanks, Russia. We want the West. We want the decadent lifestyle. We want the EU. We want NATO. So that's Chechnya, Hungary, Poland was 1999. In 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia all join NATO. In 2009, Alberta and Croatia. In 2017, Montenegro. In 2010, 20, North Macedonia. They all join NATO. And all these countries are rejecting the Russian uh, kind of autocratic way of, of life, the communist regimes, and moving more into a capitalist Western mindset. Now, that's not very, you know, that doesn't play very well into the worldview of Putin, that these people are our people, and now they're turning their backs on us. They need protecting from this infection from the West. And so Putin, then, is looking at this in a very uh, kind of scary way. Now, it's interesting just to also think that, can you see um, in Central Europe there, this map kind of shows like a, there's a big swathe of mountains in the middle. But to the north of Europe, you see there, there's something that is called the European Plain. Now, that is very flat land. You can drive tanks around it, no problem. And it's kind of like an invasion highway. So this is how Russia sees it. They're like, hang on a second, look. You know, when we had the Eastern Bloc, we, yeah, we've got the mountains there, but we only had a small kind of um, frontier with the West up there um, in Germany. And in fact, they had the, the, the wall, didn't they? The Berlin Wall. That fell 1991, um, was it, 1990? And now it's, it's kind of the frontier, all the, all the Soviet Union collapses, and now the frontier is, is huge. It's almost indefensible for Russia. And there's something else you need to think about from a strategic perspective. There's this thing here called the Volgograd Gap. And if an army got to, got to cut that off, it would cut Russia off from the southern seas, which are important because the northern seas freeze. So in the winter, you'd have no boats, right? And in fact, in World War II, the Germans tried to do that, tried to cut the Volga, um, Volgograd Gap off. They got as far as Stalingrad. And Russia sent everything to Stalingrad and just about defeated the Germans. And the reason they did that was because Germany was trying to do exactly what I've mentioned, cut the Russians off from these southern seas. So it's so important to Putin, to Russia, to do something about, as they see it, this kind of encroachment into their territories. Apparently, NATO gave them assurances that they wouldn't expand. And so from the Russian viewpoint, um, What's gone on in Ukraine is really bad because the Ukrainians have, again, like all of the others that have joined NATO, started to turn to the West. It happened in the early 2000s. In fact, it reached its crescendo, you might recall, in 2014, where Russia you know, said, no, we can't do that. They, 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 they kind of supported breakaway groups in the East, and they actually annexed the Crimea. We all saw that. We thought, could this be it? And then it sort of died down. And now we're back again, edge of our seats. And that's how prophecy works sometimes, isn't it? Could, this could be the thing. It might not. This could be the spark of all of the things we're going to talk about. It may not. But whatever it is, we see the movements of Russia starting to build up its image empire. It's not scared of the West, is it, anymore? And so we're on the edge of our seats. And it's interesting that in... The, there's plenty of articles about this floating around the internet about how Putin has had this focus on his military after the collapse of the Soviet Union, how there's been this build-up 
uh, of modernizing the military. Whilst the, the Western countries are getting weaker, Russia is getting stronger. Desire to be a global power. It succeeded in modernizing its military. We read here that, that loads of, you know, I could give you tons of stats of the power of the Russian uh, army. The Russian navy is also of one of the most powerful sea forces we read there. The world's second largest fleet of submarines uh, deployed with the ballistic missiles. We've got three million personnel, including reservists, making it the largest, one of the largest forces across the world. They're not scared. They're powerful now. People used to laugh at Christadelphians in the 90s when we said Russia's going to come and invade. To quote Nigel Farage, they're not laughing now. Russia is arguably the world's largest tank repertoire. We read there that it not only has all these armaments and these um, really horrifying weapons, but it also uses diplomacy, cyber attacks, and social media and sleight of hand. We saw that, didn't we? Just last week, Macron comes out of a meeting with Putin and he says to the French, Russia has said they're not going to invade. The next day, Russia's invading. So we see Russia doing this. And, and back end of last year, the troops built up, didn't they? Russia said, as if, it's as if it said, no, no more now. Okay, no more NATO expansion. Ukraine, you can't go and join NATO. Um, the politics in Ukraine were interesting. They were starting to make noises again to go back to, to, to NATO and even join the EU. Russia says no. Puts all its troops on the, on the border, um, and then NATO builds its troops on the border, and then literally only two days ago, they launched the full-scale attack on the Ukraine. Now, I think we need to also be mindful in our prayers, brothers and sisters, as we talk about this, that we have brothers and sisters, Christadelphians living in Ukraine right now, and we pray, do we not, brothers and sisters, that God protects them at this time. Because as I say, anyone aged 18 to 60 is expected to bear arms and fight the Russians. If you're on the front lines or near the front lines or trying to get across the street and there's a blockade and a man says, take this gun, go to that trench, shoot that Russian, and you, you think they're going to have time to, to have a sensible discussion about bi what the Bible says about violence and what Christ says, no, they're going to bang, you're dead. That's it, goodbye. That's the seriousness of what our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are facing. And I think we need to remember them all in our prayers and all our ecclesias need to remember them in our prayers that God may protect them at this very difficult time. And so just to bring you bang up to date, they're expecting Kiev to fall today. They're all over the place. It's very interesting. You know, we talked about the Rus, the Rus, and the Russians. Well, guess currently who Russia has as their strongest ally in the region? The Belarus, the Belarus. And they're coming and invading from there as well. Putin's threatened the West with the greatest con consequences in history. And this is why, as Bible believers, we sit up and we think, we expect a global dominant Russia that will eventually fall down into the mountains of Israel. We expect an aggressive leader, Gog, of the land of Magog. We expect the Rus, who originated in that area of Kiev, to be united with the peoples of the Rus and come against it. We also expect them, let's be honest, to dominate and have control over Europe because in this chapter of Ezekiel 38, we have European powers mentioned of Goma and also of Magog. And so we expect something to change. What is that thing that's going to change? What is it that's going to bring Europe under the control of Russia? We're not entirely sure. We're not told, but we know it's going to happen. We're seeing it begin. And we're seeing that experts, the NATO chief, warns us that Russian aggression is the new normal in Europe. It's a crisis in security. Now, why? Why is it? Yes, there's strategic reasons, but I mentioned there's cultural reasons why Putin wants the Ukraine. And it's interesting he wrote this article. I don't know if anyone saw this. He actually wrote this at the back end of last year in the summer, in 2021, and he said this. It's like a, his own blog post on his website. He said, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descendants of the ancient Rus. Rus. 
which was the largest state in Europe. I am confident that true, that the, that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Our spiritual, human, and civilizational ties formed for centuries and have their origins in the same sources. They have been hardened by common trials, achievements, and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the hearts and the memory of people living in modern Russia and Ukraine, in the blood ties that unite millions of our families. Together, we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful, for we are one people. And the Bible tells us that these peoples will be together at the great crisis when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It's as if this man has read Elpis Israel, isn't it? It's unbelievable, almost. And what's been going on? The West are worried that Putin is not going to stop at Ukraine. He's unpredictable. He's wild. No one knows what's going to happen next. He's got all, a whole army that are now battle-trodden. You know, they've, they've, they, they, the battle-tested, I think, is the word. If he wants to take back more, he might do. And it's very interesting today... Putin reveals, look at that, the Mail Online, plan to dominate Europe beyond Ukraine. Neighbors, Finland and Sweden, are warned they will face military and political consequences if they join NATO. And listening to the news, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? The Western powers, Biden, Boris Johnson, they're not doing anything. They're not even establishing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Why? Because if they do, then they'll be forced to shoot at Russian planes. And if they shoot at Russian planes, it is World War III because Russia then goes to war with everybody else. And by the way, behind Russia is China and Iran. Nobody wants World War III, but they're going to get sucked in. The prophecies are clear. Something has got to change. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's sad, isn't it? You listen to the BBC and they're like, Oh, we're putting sanctions on Russia. And, oh no, the European, you know, song contest, Eurovision. Russia won't be able to sing in Eurovision anymore. And, oh no, the Champions League final will be moved from St. Petersburg to Paris. Shame on you, Russia. You know, and Russia, do you think Putin is trembling in his boots because he can't buy an Italian handbag anymore? Come on. The West is weak. It knows it. And Putin knows it. They're immune to these sanctions. They've got deals with China, deals with Iran. And here's the really scary thing. We're facing an energy crisis, as we all know, anyone that's just paid their gas bill or topped up their car today. And often, a lot of that gas, particularly, comes from Russia. And it's interesting in the news, I, I was listening today, they were talking about SWIFT, which is a way of making international payments. And the international community in the West is saying, we should shut Russia off of that. But they can't do it. And do you know why? Because if they stop being able to pay Russia, Russia's going to turn the tap off on the gas. Seriously. So when you pay your extra fuel prices, when you pay your gas prices, and guess what? All that gas prices are now nice and sky high. So guess who's, who's winning on that? Russia. And who needs money to fuel a war against the West? Russia. So all of this is actually fueling, all of, your, all of the gas prices are fueling the very battle that the West doesn't want to have to face. It's, it's mind-boggling to actually think that through. But they're scared because as soon as they, they enter war with Russia, as soon as they stop doing that, Russia has the power. And Russia knows it. It's a geopolitical war. They're painfully reliant on Putin. They're hooked on Russian gas. Now, I've not said much about Turkey. There's more we could probably say. But we mentioned in Daniel 11, we kind of do believe that the king of the north will come against Constantinople and come down. That's what Christadelphians have believed for many years. And so we look a little bit at what's going on in Turkey, who are economically very weak. And um, it's fascinating to just see this, that the Ukraine asked Turkey to shut the Black Sea waterways to Russian ships. You know, wouldn't it be interesting if Turkey, who is NATO as well, decide to do something like that, and Russia takes a little bit of a, a you know, a, a, a not pleasant start with Turkey. You could see this potentially blowing up, couldn't you? What about Iran? I've mentioned China and Iran, they stand side by side with Putin. They facing, they're facing off against the West together. They did drills together. They're all together. If America, Britain, the European NATO powers step in to help, Russia, uh, to help the Ukraine, you can very well expect China and Iran to step in to help Russia. That's why Putin doesn't care. 
And look at this. Iran is, and, and I've read actually that China is as well, they're, the, they're, they're basically taking the Russian narrative um, of what's going on in the Ukraine. They're saying that NATO provoked Russia to invade by expanding. So really fascinating to just watch. What about Israel? Now, Brother John's going to talk about Israel, so I don't, hope I don't tread on his toes too much. But it's very interesting to note this, that the Ukraine went to the Israelis and they said, look, this was back in the last year, um, please could we buy the Iron Dome uh, technology, which shoots down missiles before they land. It's a revolutionary technology that the Israelis developed to stop the missiles coming from the Gaza Strip into their homes, into their civilized areas. And Israel said no, eventually. They said they might do, and then they said no. And it was reported that the reason that they said no was because they didn't want to have a crisis with Russia. And you think, oh my goodness, like what, is, what does that mean? And, and you think that, that really, just to the north of Israel, we have the Syrian crisis still ongoing with the proxy war with Russia and Iran supporting uh, Assad and the Syrian government. And we have the Americans and the Turkish um, and uh, supporting um, the, the rebels, a proxy war going on, just as, the, you know, as we'll see, you know, the Bible has sort of prophesied these groups of nations being together. And it's just to the north. And uh, America's stepping out and stepped out of Syria. They stepped out of Afghanistan. And who's coming in? Well, we know the Russians did. And we know the Russians are in. They're expanding their military capabilities in the north of Israel because we expect them to come down into Israel from that area. They're conducting joint patrols right on Israel's border with the Syrians over the Golan. And very interestingly, they're, they're really, you know, having these Russians saying they've got concerns that the Israelis are, are bombing the Syrians. So there's this massive tension and powder keg in that area of the world as well. And most fascinatingly, literally just yesterday, Israel came out and basically expressed a little bit of sympathy with the Ukraine. It wasn't like a full-blown support. And immediately, the Russians called the Israeli ambassador. And they, as, as this report said in Haaretz, they slammed the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights, where Russia's operating, and uh, after Jerusalem supported the Ukraine. And so we watch, don't we? We look at this. We can see these things happening before our very eyes. Brothers and sisters, let us wake up to what's going on. And they said to these Israelis when they were for them, why are you backing the Nazis? You know, in Russia, there's this strange narrative. Putin thinks that he's fighting Nazis. I don't know where he gets that from, frankly, but that is the narrative that's going on. So there we are. We've got one more to do before I sit down. Let's go over to Zechariah chapter 14. By the way, did you see in Ezekiel 38 that that invading force comes to take a spoil? And here in Zechariah chapter 14, look at this. It says, behold, verse 1, the day of Yahweh, the great day of God Almighty, it said in Revelation 16. The day of Yahweh cometh, and thy, Israel's spoil, shall be divided in the midst of, of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So we've got the same story. We have all the nations gathered against Jerusalem for Armageddon. A valley of, like, a, like in, in, in a valley of judgment. We see Jerusalem's taken, but then we see, verse 3, that God goes forth to fight. How does God act? Well, it says in verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal, yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And Yahweh my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. 
Now, we believe as Christadelphians, because we understand what we call God manifestation, that Yahweh, which is God's name, can be manifest or born by, by other beings. It's born by angels. And it's also going to be born by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. And we can see that there because all the saints at verse 5 are with this person whose feet touch the Mount of Olives that bears the Yahweh name in that time. So we believe this is talking about God, yes, acting through Christ and the saints when Christ returns. Remember in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are with Christ on the Mount of Olives and they see him ascend up and, he, and the, angel or the, 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 the angel appears and says, this same Jesus which ye have seen go up into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. And this is the very spot where he's going to come back and his feet are going to touch that Mount of Olives and notice there's a massive earthquake. Where did we read of that? Ezekiel 38. You see how it all intertwines, into, in, interconnects. And Christ is there. Now, it's very hard to drive a tank when there's a massive earthquake going on. And even afterwards, you can't get up ridges and stuff. It's very hard. The nations don't know what's coming. Putin thinks he's got some good weapons. And by the way, he does. But nothing compared to the power of our God. So there's this geological event that takes place where the mountain splits in two. And verse 8 tells us springs appear in Jerusalem. And what's the outcome? Well, in verse 9, Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, one Yahweh, and his name one. So we know what's going to happen. This is the kingdom where God is king over the kingdom of, of men, which is destroyed, and the kingdom of God, the, the, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel will occur, as we all believe. And in, in verse 20, doesn't it? It says, in that day, there shall, that, that there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto Yahweh. And the pots in Yahweh's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. So God's temple is restored. And it says all the nations eventually, verse 21, will go up to Jerusalem and sacrifice. That's the kingdom. It's a picture of the kingdom. We read in verse 14 that Judah and um, the people of Israel will, will fight. And they will turn again the, uh, the attack of Gog and Gog will come to his end. So we're told very specifically what's going to happen. But notice, again in passing, in verse 12, And this shall be the plague, wherewith Yahweh will smite the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Isn't it fascinating? We're seeing pestilence, plague. It's the same word, pestilence, that we saw in Ezekiel 38. We've been suffering from that in a minor form up until this point. So all the signs of the times are there, brothers and sisters. It is an exciting time. It's a worrying time. It's a scary time. We have not got long. I've shown you how some just scratch the surface of some of the connections between these prophecies. There's loads more. There is no doubt that these prophecies all connect. There is no doubt that this vision of the future is what the prophets are teaching us. There is no doubt that we, the generation living in the latter days, after Israel has returned to their land, should be thinking and being motivated by these things. Let us turn our backs on the things of the world. Let us turn towards the things of God and prepare ourselves. Just go back to Revelation chapter 16. Because I skipped over a verse, you might have noticed, when we went through this just earlier. Because we read the frog spirits gather the nations to the great day of God Almighty in verse 14. And then in verse 16, it tells us that, that they're gathered into Armageddon, the heap of sheaves in the valley for judgment. But before Armageddon, verse 15 takes place. Behold, says Jesus, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. And they see his shame. How are your garments doing, brothers and sisters? Because we are seeing the nations being gathered for the great day of God Almighty in verse 14. The very next thing to happen is verse 15. And all the rest, the battle of Armageddon, the overspilling down into the Holy Land of Israel, the battle at Jerusalem, takes place after. 
Because, as we read in, in Zechariah, the saints are with Christ when his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It's powerful, brothers and sisters. What is this telling us? This is telling us the Lord could appear at any time. We don't know how long the judgment's going to take. We know it must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But we don't know exactly how long that will be. We know the resurrection has to take place first. We don't know how long that's going to take. So we're seeing this stuff come to pass. We've got to be ready, brothers and sisters. We have not got long to wait. Christ must come to the household first. So what Brother Thomas to told us all those years ago as a community. We have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople and his overflowing and passive over and stretching forth his power over Egypt and the Holy Land. This will certainly come to pass, but it will all be consequent upon and not antidescent to the appearing of Christ. In other words, the return of Christ to the household happens before the invasion of Gog. So he could come tomorrow and all of the rest of the things we've talked about can play out in the background as Christ goes through the resurrection and the judgment with the saints. How ready do we need to be, brothers and sisters? Very ready is the answer. We are right at the end. Now, I just want to say one final thing before shutting up. And that is this. We've run through these things super fast today. And if you are new to prophecy, some of this stuff might be a bit mind-blowing. So I just wanted to give you a signpost. If you, if, you like, or to, if you want to find out more, if you want to kind of open your Bibles more with the Christadelphians, or if you, if you have been baptized for a while and just want to refresh your mind, go on to ChristadelphianVideo.org. You will find tons of talks on there. There's a wonderful team of Christadelphians that curate the talks that go on there. And uh, we know that some people have even come into the truth because we have... Uh, been preaching the gospel through those channels and also we talk a lot about prophecy on them so please do come and support Christadelphian video you will not regret it uh, you know put that on rather than something else when you get back home so the final thing the final message then is brothers and sisters we have not lo got long have we we are right uh, a second tick away before the Lord needs to return there's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled before he could come the Euphrates has dried up, seen it. Israel are back in their land. It's happening. It's happened. It's done. The nations are preparing for war. They are waking up the mighty men right now. And so we can be taken at any minute. The question we've all got for ourselves is are we ready?